Today we're going to be talking about the goddess Athena, uh, known for, uh, she's the goddess of wisdom, of justice, of the arts, of literature, of strategic warfare. Uh, she is the one who supposedly came from Zeus's head, right? Uh, using his weapons. Uh, she's clever. Uh, she's independent. Uh, she's all about power and truth and justice, but also enlightenment and humility. Uh, she is definitely a very important goddess. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and jump into some of the backgrounds of her in general. Now, uh, as as you as I just mentioned, as an overview, she's a very important goddess, and the Greeks sang many hymns uh, to Athena, telling much about her early attributes. Uh, some of the earliest of these songs uh, date back to the seventh to the fourth centuries BCE, and they're known as the Homeric hymns. Uh, in the Homeric hymn number eleven to Athena. Uh, it presents this deity as dedicated to war. So she was, I know we think of her as a goddess of wisdom, but she was viewed also as a war goddess, right? Uh, akin to Ares. Uh, and of course, I'm going to read uh, from him number 11. It says as follows, of Pallas Athena, guardian of the city, I begin to sing, dread is she. And with Ares, she loves the deeds of war, the sack of cities, and the shouting, and the battle. It is she who saves the people as they go to war and come back. Hail, goddess, and give us good fortune and happiness. Right, and that, right away, we see the word, or hear the word palace. Palace uh, could, be derived, could be derived from the Greek word meaning maiden. Uh, it is most likely pre-Mycenaean, so possibly Minoan in origin. Eventually, Alice became a character uh, in her own right, uh, who is the name of a friend of Athena, but whom she accidentally killed. And so, according to the story, uh, she subsequently took on the name Alice in honor of her friend. Now, the story follows that Pallas was the daughter of Triton. Uh, in fact, uh, we see that uh, what happened is that um, Triton acted as, in a sense, a foster parent to Zeus's daughter, to Athena. And so Triton raised her along with Pallas. Now, they had these uh, two ladies, they're growing up together. They're sort of like sisters. They oftentimes fought one another. Play fight, Dean, I think. At least I hope, right? And, but unfortunately, uh, what happened is in one of these play fights, Pallas was mortally wounded. In fact, uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you the story. According uh, to Pseudo Apollodorus, uh, in his Bibliotheca, uh, he says, they say after Athena's birth that she was reared by Triton, who had a daughter named Pallas. Both girls cultivated the military life, which once led them into a contentious dispute. As Pallas was about to give Athena a whack, Zeus skittishly held out the Aegis. And so she glanced up to protect herself and thus was wounded by Athena and fell. And of course, uh, Athena was very upset. She's very sad. And out of this regret, she created what is known as the Palladium, which is a statue in the likeness of Pallas. In fact, the uh, pseudo Polydorus continues, he says, extremely saddened by what happened to Pallas, Athena fashioned a wooden statue in the likeness of her and around its breast tied the Aegis, which had frightened her, and set the statue beside Zeus and paid it honor. So there you have it. Um, of course, later on, Electra, after her seduction, sought refuge at the statue 
whereupon uh, Zeus threw both her and the Palladium uh, into the Ilian land and so forth and so on. But we don't need to know that, right? <laughs> so, so this is the supposed origins uh, of, uh, of the name Pallas, although we're going to go into some other bits and pieces on this word too. I'm just kind of introducing you to her. Uh, yet, according to the Homeric Hymn 39 uh, to Athena, I kind of want to start with some strong primary sources. So you get an idea of what the Greeks feel about her from their own words. This is why I do this. Um, it says, uh, basically, it depicts Athena as a virgin goddess and known for her inventive ways, although she is still very much uh, a goddess of war as well. And this is how it goes. But I do want to, this gets a little meaty. So not meaty, but meaty. I began to sing of Alice Athena, the glorious goddess, bright-eyed. Uh, by the way, I'll stop right there, bright-eyed. She is known, this epithet, she is known as the one who has the bright eyes. You'll see this all the way through the literature. This is common use. So her eyes are bright eyes, not only in an intelligent sense, but in a physical manifestation sense. So she is the one who is the bright eyes. So bright eyed, invented. So she's inventive, right? Unbending of heart, pure virgin, savior of cities, courageous, tritogenia. <laughs> tritogenia. Don't worry, we'll, we'll unpack that word in a few moments. From his awful head, why is Zeus himself bear her arrayed in warlike arms of flashing gold and awe seized all the gods as they gazed? Now, uh, awful head is not awful as an ugh, awful as they got to watch. Our English language changes, of course, which was really translated from Greek. But it used to mean, of course, full of awe. That's the awful hit. <laughs> okay. So, but as, so here's, of course, the story of, of, of her arising from the head of Zeus. All this stuff, no worries, we're going to unpack. But Athena sprang quickly from the immortal head and stood before Zeus, who holds the Aegis, which is, of course, he's the skin, has the Gorgon on it, shaking a sharp spear. Great Olympus began to reel horribly as the might of the gray-eyed goddess and the earth round about cried fearfully and the sea was moved and tossed with dark waves while foam burst forth suddenly. Beautiful words, beautiful words. Uh, here she is, the gray-eyed goddess. We're going to go into this a little bit later. Sometimes she is known as the blue-eyed goddess. And we'll go on to that distinction in a little bit. Here, she is the gray-eyed goddess. Okay. It says, the bright sun of Ethereum, this is Helios the sun, stopped his swift-footed horses a long while until the maiden palace, Athena, had stripped the heavenly armor from her mortal shoulders, and why Zeus was glad. Hail to you, daughter of Zeus, who holds the ages. Oh, there's a lot here. You see already, by the time of this hymn, uh, there are so many different ideas that are already well-formed in this Homeric hymn. Uh, as I said before, you're going to see the gray-eyed goddess. Here's something already. I'll go further into this. She is the gray-eyed goddess when she's associated with Zeus. But... She becomes known as the blue-eyed goddess when she's associated with Poseidon. Why would she be associated with Poseidon? Because in other mythologies and stories, she's not the daughter of Zeus. She's the daughter of Poseidon. Ooh, <laughs> there's the first big reveal. <laughs> Okay, so, and I'll unpack that a little bit later. I guess you're going to have to stay around for a little while, don't you, right? Okay, so, uh, any, anyways, uh, for the, the, the designation Tritogenia, 
Triatogenia uh, it, it comes from a kind of a surname. We find this in the Iliad. We find this mentioned in the Odyssey. We find this in Hesiod's Theogony. Uh, so what does this word tritogenia mean? Uh, some say well, this means it's from the lake Tritonus in Libya, near where she is said to have been born. Wait, no, 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 wait. Uh, hold on. You just said that she was born from Zeus's head. We just went there. Well, apparently there's another story. <laughs> uh, Euripides, Apollodorus, uh, Herodotus, they all mentioned the fact that uh, she, there's another story, that she was born in Libya, in North Africa, that she has a North African background. Who? Hmm. And that's the Greeks talking to you. Others say this word uh, refers to the stream known as Triton uh, near Alakomene uh, in Boethia, which is, of course, Greeks where she was worshiped, and where, according to some other statements, uh, she was born. So she's born here, in this place. Wait, again, they're going, there's another, there's another story. She's born not out of the head. Yeah, well, there you have it. Lastly, of course, uh, you have the grammarians uh, say that the word trito, which is a, a dialect, signifies the head, S signifies the head. So that the goddess was born out of the head of her father, and of course, this is presumed to be Zeus. Okay, so this is where we get this idea. Got it? So, but the tri part could also refer to, as far as trichogenia, but also refer to the idea of three, and could possibly because it's Indo-European root where we get our words like tricycle, trinity, <laughs> right? So, so it could be referring to the, the three born, tritogenia, the three born aspect, the three aspects of Athena, which co of course goes back uh, into the triune goddess conceptions that we see with the Mycenaeans and earlier with the Minoans and with the Luvians. And the, you know, so, so this kind of goes back a little bit further. Right, and once again, uh, the word palace uh, could actually be uh, Minoan, maybe earlier as a title. What are you guys thinking so far, huh? <laughs> yeah, I know. We start off this nice talk with Athena, and we just kind of blowing away all the perspectives. Right? <laughs> it's like, wait, hey, wait, Poseidon, not, not Zeus. Wait, he's uh, not born always out of the head. What's going on here? Okay, so now we have the Orphic hymns. Uh, they're a little bit later than the Homeric hymns, uh, roughly around the 3rd century BCE to the 2nd century BCE. Uh, there is an Orphic hymn, uh, 32, to Athena. Uh, and it says as follows, and I'm going to unpack this one too. It says, only begotten, noble race of Zeus, blessed and fierce, who joyous in caves to rove, O oh, warlike Pallas, whose illustrious kind, I like the kindness aspect, ineffable and effable we find, magnanimous and famed, the rocky height and groves and shady mountains, the delight. I love the natural connections there. Uh, in arms rejoicing, who with furies dire and wild, the souls of mortal dust inspire the furies huh? gymnastic virgin of terrific mind <laughs> gymnastic virgin <laughs> okay. dire gorgon's pain unmarried blessed kind mother of arts here we get the mother here's, here comes the connection to the arts impetuous understood as fury by the bad but wisdom by the good ferocious he's scary to those who are evil, who are bad, but she is wisdom by those who are good. Hold your breath. The next line is a big one. Male, sorry, female and male. The arts of war are thine. Wait, wait you heard that, right? Wait, wait. female and male? 
you'll find out as we go along that Athena moves into the realm of the masculine as well as the feminine. She can be both. She can be neither at some point. It just depends, which gets, again, fascinating. Oh, much formed the Kania, which means she dragon, inspired the vine over the uh, Philidrian giants, roused to ire, thy courses driving with destructive ire. Here again, here's a line. Trifogenia of splendid mean, perjure of evils, all victorious queen. Hear me, O goddess, when I thee I pray with supplicating voice both night and day. And in my latest hour, give peace and health, propitious times and necessary wealth. And ever present by the votary's aid, O much implored, arch parent, blue-eyed maid. Blue-eyed maid. You go, wait a minute. There's, there's a reference to the blue-eyed maiden aspect here, too. It's like, wait. So remember, she's known as the gray-eyed, oftentimes in connection with Zeus. But she's known as the blue-eyed in connection with Poseidon. Uh, you saw that Thracania. You saw that she-dragon aspect. Now, of course, according to the Homeric hymn of, of Apollo uh, from the 6th century BCE, the Dracania, or the she-dragon, was slain by Apollo at the Oracle of Delphi and only became known as the python when her body began to rot in the sun. The word, by the way, python itself means in Greek to rot. Sorry, <laughs> I know. Yeah, you have your, your python, you're going, what? It means to rot? <laughs> yeah, well, words change their meaning as time goes on. But there you have it. It also connects to the name Python. According to mythology, Typhon was unable to save the she dragon, Dracana. The mother of Typhon was understood to be Hera, who created him when she struck the earth in anger uh, because she discovered that, you know, according to this story, uh, she, when she found out that Zeus had given birth to Athena from his head, she was so angry, she slammed on the ground. And as a result, well, uh, this this life was created, you know this. So uh, this type of, to proceed further, Hera piling evil upon evil actually handed the newborn Typhon to Dracania, the she dragon to suckle, and so the she dragon became, in a sense, Typhon's wet nurse and took on the role as his mother figure. Dracania then suckled Typhon, uh, and known as the Corican caves in Cilicia. Okay, so so wait a second. But here, uh, she is known. Athena is known as the Thracena. She's known as the she dragon. You know, but the she dragon is something separate from her, according to the mythology. So this title Dracena goes further back before this mythology occurred. You guys got it further back earlier. It's a remnant where Athena is connected to this she-dragon as opposed to the one who defeated it. You guys got it? Is this interesting? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're digging further. We're going all the way back. Of, of course, uh, we can go into uh, uh, the references uh, in, the, uh, in the Iliad and the Odyssey. I do want to mention uh, there is, of course, a Homeric uh, piece known as the Cypria. This is a lost epic tale. And it kind of, kind of gives the background of the um, of reasons behind uh, the conflict in Troy. And in this, there's a preservation here aspect. You have the judgment of Paris. And we all probably know the story. Most of us, right, how it goes. Um, uh, it goes as follows that there's a marriage now between the goddess Thetis uh, and the mortal Peleus, right? These, by the way, are the parents of Achilles. Uh, and uh, Zeus decided he just, he's going to have a great party, great banquet up in Olympus, and everybody's invited. They invite everybody except for Eris, uh, goddess of discord. Now, I don't know why you wouldn't want to invite a goddess dedicated to discord and chaos uh, to a, a wedding. <laughs> Maybe you do know why. So, uh, so what happens is is that she's not invited. The wedding commences, and to make a long story short, what she does 
uh, she takes an apple, a golden apple, uh, from the Garden of Hesperides, and she she writes on it uh, for the fairest one, <laughs> like the fairest one of all, right? And so she takes this golden apple and she throws it in uh, through the fence uh, and Mel Mel Lupus, and it kind of rolls there. And obviously, you know, Hera picks it up and goes, oh, to the fairest one, it must be me. You can see where this is going. Uh, and of course, Aphrodite is thinking, this is me, you know. You know, everybody wants, because everybody thinks that they're the fairest goddess. So I don't want to go through all this, but I just will say this, that you want to ask, ask Zeus, which one is the fairest? And he's all, I think I'm going to ask somebody else. Because, <laughs> you know, his wife is amongst those uh, who's asking him, and he doesn't want to get himself in trouble, uh, and of course. So he gives it to a Paris, who's a who's a mortal, uh, and he's going to be the one who decides. <laughs> yeah, good luck, Paris. So Paris is the one there that decides. But what happens uh, is that uh, each of them uh, goes down. Uh, there's three goddesses that kind of try to provide a little inducement, uh, try to you know make him decide uh, to choose them instead. And of course, uh, you're going to have a Hera says, hey, I'm going to make you a great king. Athena arrives. And what she's going to promise him is that she's going to give him wisdom and make him a great warrior. So here you have uh, in the story now the combination between wisdom and war. I'm going to make you wise. You are going to be a great warrior. We know the story. Aphrodite shows up <laughs> and she uses her wiles and says, I'm going to give you the most beautiful woman in the world. And he forgets about Hera and Athena and he chooses Aphrodite as the most beautiful of all. Of course, the most beautiful woman in the world it happens to be, you know, Elena, you know, <laughs> uh, launched a thousand ships. You get the point. Uh, she happens to be married. But just Menelaus, it's like, yeah, you get the most beautiful woman in the world, that's true, but you're going to have to kidnap her uh, and marry to, uh, you know, a very powerful king warrior. Uh, you know, it's just it's not a good deal. And we're going to have the commencing of the, of the situation of the Iliad, right? You have the Trojan War. Okay, now, uh, in Apulus, uh, in his Golden Ass, uh, describes an ancient play in his novel that also portrays a little bit more about the story uh, and says as follows, I'll give you a little bit more details here. And of course, the name, the, the, the Latin name is Minerva. So Athena and Minerva, that is the same in a sense. There are some differences here. It says uh, as follows as a description. I want to give a description now of how she's understood. Her head was covered with a gleaming helmet. So we see now she has a helmet which was itself crowned with an olive wreath. She bore a shield and brandished a spear, simulating the goddess's fighting role. So she's a warrior. Each maiden representing a goddess was accompanied by her own escort. I find it interesting what her escort is. The girl whose appearance in arms had revealed her as Minerva, of course, Athena, was protected by two boys who were the comrades in arms of the battle goddess. And who are the two boys that accompany? Their names are Demos, which means terror, Ooh. and Metis, of course, or Phobos, which means fear. So she is accompanied by fear and terror. Wow. They pranced about with swords unsheathed. Behind her back, a flutist played a battle tune in the Dorian mode. He mingled shrill, whistling notes with deep droning chords like a trumpet blast, stirring the performers to lively and supple dancing. <laughs> so, so you have here comes Athena in all her glory, and you see behind her uh, these these two men, right, uh, or two boys, I should say, warrior boys, and of course behind the flutus, flutus, and going about, uh, and they're doing this war dance with swords. 
Ooh, well, <laughs> uh, yeah, Aphrodite did one else. According to the Iliad, attributed to uh, Homer uh, in number five, uh, Homer paints a very poetic picture of her preparing to go to battle. It says as follows. It says, meanwhile, on her father's threshold, Athena, daughter of Aegis-bearing Zeus, shed her soft embroidered robe, taken off this robe, which she had made with her own hands, put on a tunic in its place, and equipped herself for the lamentable, hmm, lamentable work of war with the arms of Zeus, the cloud compeller. So, so Zeus here is giving her his arms, his weapons, and arraying her in might. But you can notice here, we'll see this as a theme, lamentable work of war. We're going to see this again. Unlike Mars, Athena does not necessarily like war. She just likes what it could accomplish. We're going to go into this deeper. Don't worry. We'll go into the sources. Just want you to realize that she's not just a typical war goddess into the moment of fighting in and of itself. There is a distinction here. She finds war in and of itself manable. Okay. Uh, furthermore, here it is. She threw around her shoulders the horrible castled Aegis, which is beset at every point with fear and carries strife and force and the cold nightmare of pursuit within it. And also the ghastly images of Gorgon's head, the grim and redoubtable emblem of Aegis bearing Zeus. Here we go. Here we get the Gorgon. Again, a Gorgon with the Medusa, right? will be constantly uh, an image that we find on Athena, right, on her. On her head, she put her golden helmet with its four plates and double crests adorned with fighting men of 100 pounds. Then she stepped into the flaming chariot, ooh, flaming chariot, hmm, gripping the huge long spear with which she breaks the noble warrior's ranks when she, the almighty father's child, is roused to anger. What a, what an entrance. <laughs> really, I mean, you can see it all, right? Powerful goddess, right? Uh, later, book five, Homer suggests uh, that her size is quite large. Uh, it says the eager goddess took his place, took her place, excuse me, uh, in the car beside the noble Diomedes, and the beach wooden axle groaned aloud at the weight it had to carry. A formidable goddess and a mighty man of arms. So she's heavy, strong. She's powerful. So there you have it. You know, so, and then in the Odyssey, she appears in the Odyssey in connection uh, to Odysseus. Now, of course, we know this story. And, um, you know, obviously Odysseus is very much connected to wisdom, Athena, goddess of wisdom. We're looking at uh, a close pair indeed. And what happens is that he fights for 10 years. You know, and, and then of course uh, he returns. You know, I mean, it, you know, the whole thing uh, takes a while. It takes about ten years to get back. Right? So seven of the years he's having these interesting adventures with Calypso. We we'll go to there. But the point of the matter is, is that eventually he reaches back. It's back home uh, to his island. You know, back there, and uh, and uh, he's coming back to his beloved Penelope who's been waiting for him for, you know, 20 years in Ethica. 20 years. Can you imagine? You know, so, and the thing is, the first thing he thinks about when he gets back is not, well, I want to get back and see my wife who's been waiting for me for 20 years. My, my thought, his, his thought is this, uh, I want to get back because, but I want to find out if she's been faithful or not to me. What? Yeah, yeah, you know, on the final, he, she's been faithful. So what she does, what he does, is he arrives in Ithaca because he does not trust Penelope uh, for over those twenty years. He asks Athena to turn him into an old beggar, so he could check out the state uh, of the kingdom incognito and to find out 
if she has been faithful or not. Of course, she has been pursued by these suitors who are trying to you know, convince her to marry them because, you know, that way they can be king, assuming that Odysseus is past. Now, it says that with her wand, that's why I'm bringing this up. She, he made, she made this radical transformation. I think it's interesting that she has a wand. <laughs> there, right? Athena touched him now with her wand. So this is magic, right? With her wand. She withered the smooth skin on his supple limbs, robbed his head of sunburn, covered his whole body with wrinkles of old age, and dimmed the light that shone in his beautiful eyes, made him old. Now, only his dog uh, recognized him. In fact, the story goes is that uh, the dog had been waiting for 20 years. It was a long time in dog years, right? <laughs> waiting for the master to return. Uh, and so what happened is he, this little doggy sees Odysseus, who's this old, this beggar, old beggar, and still recognizes him, uh, lifts his little head up, wags its tail, and breathes his last. He dies. Oh, well, at least he got there in time, right? So what happened is this, is that the um, uh, long and the short of it is, the good news is, is eventually she, he realized that she was faithful. Uh, the suitors are killed, uh, and they live happily ever after. Uh, but I want to mention that um, um, Athena did something else to Penelope. Uh, to help things along in the end. She also wanted to make Penelope look very young and strip the years off of her spent waiting for her beloved Odysseus. This is something that I never hear talked about. But, yeah, so, so yeah, so what happens is that after the great reveal and the suitors are killed and he was with Telemachus and yay, victory, you know, son. Uh, and um, He's made young again because at the moment that happens, he's made, you know, young after, he, you know, and of course kills them all because uh, he's the only one who can string uh, his own bow. <laughs> what happens is he's, he's young again. And I love it that Athena thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make Penelope young again, too. I'm going to strip off her years so that she will look beautiful as well. Uh, even more beautiful, I should say. And I thought this is a nice thing that you never hear talked about that Athena does. But I want to mention something else that's important as a theme here. And we see this in other places. But I want to unpack this. Athena often changes forms in the Odyssey. She, yeah, she transfers, transforms herself into a bird goddess. We see this. Um, for example, uh, as she finished Bright-eyed Athena took the form of a sea eagle and flew off. Uh, but here's another bit. Uh, uh, in Book 8 of the Odyssey, Athena takes the form of a man. Quote, she has disguised herself as a young shepherd with all the delicate beauty that marks the sons of kings. So she does, she can make herself into a man. Later, uh, uh, it says her appearance altered, and now she looked like a woman, tall, beautiful, and accomplished. Great word, right? So Athena was very close uh, to Odysseus, uh, connected to, of course, the, uh, the wisdom. Uh, when Odysseus has his doubts um, in the Odyssey, Athena responds, most people are content to put their trust in far less powerful allies mere men and not equipped with wisdom such as mine, but I, that I have never ceased to watch over you and all your adventures, am a goddess. And so she is always with him. Now, what does Athena look like? We have somewhat of an idea, but let's go into some more details uh, into her appearance. We do have ancient uh, descriptions uh, because she's frequently uh, represented in art, um, so we have a good idea. Uh, she is understood, of course, uh, as an ideal of perfection. And there were three statues by Phaedius that are considered the best represent 
representation of her. So Phaedius uh, created these three statues. And so we'll kind of go through them. The first was a celebrated uh, colossal statue of the goddess uh, at the Acropolis in Athens. Yes, uh, it's made out of gold, ivory. Uh, Pausanias uh, in the second century CE uh, saw this image and described it as follows. He said, the statue is created with ivory and gold on the middle of her helmet, the middle of her helmet, this is the one, remember, I'm describing the one in the Acropolis, the Parthenon. So this is kind of a big deal. And the next detail I'm going to bring up to you is something you don't always expect. Here it is. Okay, once again. Um, in the middle of her helmet is a likeness of a sphinx. What? Yeah, there's a likeness of a sphinx in the middle of the official, most important statue and image of Athena. There's a sphinx there. On either side of the helmet are griffins in relief. The statue of Athena is upright with a tunic reaching to the feet. And on her breast is the head of Medusa, so the Gorgon, which is worked in ivory. She holds a statue of victory that is approximately four cubits in height. And in the other hand, a spear. At her feet lies a shield, and near the spear is a serpent. This serpent would be um, Eratothonius. On the pedestal is the birth of Andorra in relief. Wow. So we have some very interesting features here. Once again, the Medusa makes this connection. But uh, who is uh, this uh, Eratothonius? Well, King Erechthonius uh, was the legendary early ruler of ancient Athens. And according to some myths, uh, he was, well, born out of the soil or of the earth. So Anakathonius, right? And raised by the goddess Athena. Uh, the story follows that Athena, uh, one time um, she visited Hephaestus, you know, Hephaestus, the, the, the god of metallurgy. Right. And unfortunately, uh, he tried to run her down, chase her because he desired her. He wanted to seduce her in his very own workshop. Uh, she fled, ran away from him, <laughs> uh, and he followed after. But he caught Athena and then he tried to rape her. But she fought him off. During the struggle, his semen fell on her thigh. And Athena, in disgust, wiped it away with a scrap of wool and flung it to the earth. Okay, so, so here, Ephesus tries to get her and is unsuccessful. She fights him back. I like that, that she fought him back. Demon goes on her leg, flings it off, goes to the earth. But as a result, Erechthonius is born from the semen that fell from the earth. Now, Athena doesn't want to abandon this child, so raises it in secret. I know you haven't heard this story before, have you? <laughs> and, and and placed uh, him in a small box. <laughs> uh, Athena gave the small box uh, to three daughters. Uh, Herse, Pandrosus and Ogrus of uh, Cecrops. Cecrops, who is the king of Athens. Cecrops, remember that name, is the king of Athens. And warned them never to open it. So whatever you do, don't open this box. Of course, they're overcome with curiosity. And so they open the box, which contained the infant and the future king, Erechthonius, which, of course, kind of means... Uh, this is a rough translation, Erechthonius, you can hear it. Uh, kind of trouble that comes from the earth. Uh, sources are unclear regarding how many sisters participated in this grand revelation. But uh, there you have it. Yes, there is a connection uh, that to Demeter caring for this child. Uh, that's very good uh, observation. Somebody just brought that up. The sisters were terrified by what they saw in the box. 
because they either saw uh, a snake that was wrapped around the infant, or in some versions of the story, it was half man, half serpent. Uh, and, well, and they were insane. <laughs> uh, they were crazy. Uh, and they threw themselves off the Acropolis. <laughs> Talk about a dramatic story. Hey, try to have this as a film someday, right? <laughs> it would never, it would never get it. Uh, a bizarre story. But, you know, you're here to hear the bizarre stories. So uh, there you have it. And I know you're not going to forget this one, right? Other accounts of state that the snake killed them. So they either jump off the Acropolis uh, after this great reveal, or they, um, or he kills them. When he grew up, Erechthonius uh, drove out the Amphiton, uh, who had usurped the throne, Phancranius 12 years earlier, and then he did become king of Athens. Uh, he married uh, Praxica and Naed, and they had a son, Pandion I. During this time now, Athena, there's more Athena story, right, frequently protected him. So she was still there, protected him. Uh, he was the one who founded a great festival known as the uh, Pan Athenic Festival. And of course, this was done in honor of Athena, who's kind of his pseudo mom figure, right? I mean, it's not really because it come, came off his her leg, but well, there you have it. And set up a wooden statue of her on the Acropolis. And so there you have it. Um, in fact, uh, we can go further on that, but uh, there you have it. By the way, Eric Athonius, uh, he, his feet were lame, and, um, you know, so he had problems walking, and supposedly he invented uh, the, you know, some various ways, like the four-horse chariot, uh, Quadrica, in some cases, some stories. Uh, Zeus was supposedly impressed by his skills and raised him up to the heavens. Uh, he, by the way, uh, still continues to be there in the constellation up in the sky, uh, dedicated uh, to the charioteer or the Arga, if you know you're, you're interested in astronomy, uh, he's still there. Okay, well, that was a nice elaborate story, but tells a lot. <laughs> All that. Oh, yeah, we're still talking about the statues of Athena. <laughs> That's right. The second statue of Athena, uh, Mephadius, uh, was, was a great bronze statue made out of the spoils taken by the Athenians uh, from the Battle of Marathon. The third statue. Uh, by Phaedius was a small bronze statue called the beautiful or the Lamnian Athena, because the Lamnians had dedicated it to Athens. Uh, the first of these statues represented the goddess in a standing position, uh, bearing in her hand a Nike of uh, victory, uh, four cubits in height. The shield stood by her feet. Her robe came down to her feet. On the breast was the head of Medusa. In her right hand, she bore a lance, and at her feet, there lay again a serpent. Now, of course, <clears throat> you know, Phaedius, when he made his statue uh, for the Acropolis, he got himself in trouble. Uh, these, there's charges that Phaedius had taken too much of the gold allocated for the use of the statue of Athena uh, and was basically got himself exiled on these charges. Uh, that he is embezzled as a result of the loss of the gold. He does eventually get back, but there you have it. Uh, taking a look at uh, taking a look at the statues, we take a look at the various aspects. We see again all three of them. We see the helmet, the big deal. We see the Sphinx in many of them. We see the Griffins. We see images of the horses, and then you have the Aegis. Aegis. I say this word, and you go. Okay, what, what is this? Aegis, A-E-G-I-S. Now this is interpreted as an animal skin which draped over one of her shoulders and often bears the image of a Gorgon's head. Okay, once again, so this is animal skin that's over one of her shoulders. Now, the Greek uh, historian Herodotus believed that the origins for the Aegis came from Libya. He states, Athena's garments and Aegis were borrowed by the Greeks from the Libyan women who are dressed in exactly the same way. 
except that their leather garments are fringed with thongs and not serpents. Wow. Okay, so now as for the word Aegis, what does it mean? Well, there's a few interpretations. Uh, it can mean a violent windstorm. If you take a look at the verb, uh, the word aso, right? Uh, it could mean I, I rush or move violently. It can mean that. Uh, it can mean a thunderstorm. I'm looking at the Greek here, right? Uh, it can mean also, though, it could mean uh, it can, X coming from the, the actually root word of goat. And it could mean that it is goat skin. And it could be connected to, to Zeus in the goat skin context. Now, what happens according to the Iliad, the Aegis, this, this, this piece, this, this animal skin, made sounds that you could hear. It actually made, what, it made sounds? <laughs> yeah. In fact, uh, the Iliad says it produced a, a sound as from a myriad roaring dragons. I love hearing these kinds of details, which you never hear elsewhere. So this Aegis, this is, I mean, come on, this is the Iliad. How come we don't pay attention to these details? It makes a roaring noise. Trigodia. Thank you, David. Yes. <laughs> right. A roaring noise. Uh, according to, to Virgil, the Cyclops uh, at Aces's Forge busily burnished the Aegis Athena wears in her angry moods. <laughs> uh, a fearsome thing with a surface of gold like scaly snakeskin and the linked serpents and the gorgon herself upon the goddess's breast a severed head rolling its eyes. So this ages, this skin, which makes noises, uh, is covered with what? It looks what's well, scaly, scales. It has these scales on it, right? Uh, and then it has, with it, it has serpents. And we see elsewhere these serpents, bits of serpents are kind of laying out around it like tassels. And then on top of it, you have this, this Gorgon, this Medusa on her chest. Wow. I mean, this is kind of a scary thing. It really is. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, when Zeus shakes his aegis, it was believed Mount Ida became wrapped in clouds. The thunder rolls and men are struck down with fear. And so at times he was called aegis bearing Zeus. He is also known to loan his aegis to Athena, giving her in this sense, power. And again, the Aegis is described as having many tassels upon it, according to Book 2 of the Iliad, as I mentioned before. Uh, and with them, with Athena, the flashing eyes, and the flashing eyes, bright eyes, flashing eyes, wearing her splendid cloak, the unfading, everlasting Aegis, from which a hundred tassels flutter, all beautifully made, each worth a hundred head of cattle. Oh, wow. Okay. But of course, the question is, uh, whose skin is the Aegis made out of? Now, Euripides assumed uh, that the skin was that of the Gorgon, of that uh, Medusa slain by Athena. So that's one possibility. There's another version. So the skin was of X, a daughter of Helios, often represented as a Fire breathing, methodic serpent. Uh, this uh, she was slain and flayed by Athena. So, and that's that's the skin. A third story is a little strange. It's the skin of a monstrous giant by the name of Pallas. A monstrous giant by the name of Pallas. We just talked about Pallas as being Triton's daughter, and oh, so this is from. An, an earlier source, even though it's quoted by John Tietzis around 1110 to 1180, his lifespan. So this is still an earlier source where, where the uh, Alice uh, could have been another kind of creature. And the fourth, 
is the skin from Zeus's pet goat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have these three fearsome ones, and then you have Zeus's goat, his pet goat. Okay, so not as fierce, but here it is, right? Uh, in the investigation of uh, of Hittite and Luvian records, uh, Sarah Morris from UCLA uh, investigated a connection between what is the Aegis, the skin, and the Hittite and Luvian cursa. Both words, if, it, if we go for the goat, in, you know, interpretation, both words designate goat skin and are cult attributes that are worn by by deities. So uh, I like what uh, what she says. I'm going to quote her. Um, uh, Morris declares, I propose that an ancestor of such begs once decorated a prehistoric cult object at Ephesus or was widely familiar in Western Anatolia and was absorbed by earlier cult images. Particularly striking is the description of multiple eggs standing up in certain texts, in particular in the festival to renewing the person. So what happens is this, is that in ancient Anatolia, they would have these bags made out of animal skins that were wrapped around or hung around the statues of their deities, the Hittites, the Luvians, and other groups. And in these bags, they were, there were pockets or multiple bags that carried magical amulets and ritualistic instruments and all kinds of things that are used for power and potency. Power when it comes to yielding uh, you know, fruit, uh, from 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 the fields and and also of course procreation right so so you have this and so so this ages that is a remnant that goes back uh, to these ancient images fascinating right another attribute is uh, her round argolic uh, shield at the center of which of course uh, again you have the head of Medusa you see a theme here. Okay, so I guess we got to talk about Medusa just a little bit because I keep bringing her up. According to Hesiod's uh, Theogony, there are three sisters. Uh, two of them were immortal. Uh, one is Steno, and the other is Ureo. And the third was, yeah, Medusa, right? Uh, they were children of Boric and Eto, and they lived according uh, to Hesiod beyond the famed Oceanus at the world's edge, hard by night. Of the three, as I said, only Medusa uh, had a mortal life. Now, according to Ovid's Metamorphosis, although the story is long earlier, but the, the story follows that Medusa was an absolutely beautiful maiden, and she was attracted to Poseidon. Now, this attraction to Poseidon we learn more about Poseidon as we go along in this talk. Uh, you can see why Athena's acting the way she is, but we weren't there yet. Um, uh, she's attracted to Poseidon, who then makes love to her in Athena's shrine. So Poseidon, who in some sources happens to be Athena's father, as opposed to Zeus, makes love in her temple dedicated to her to Medusa because of uh, this ritual violation and this insult. Athena transformed her into the scary, snaky-haired Gorgon that we know so well uh, and the face that's able to turn one into stone. Ovid states, Medusa once had charms to gain her love. A rival crowd of envious lovers strove. They who have seen her own, they never did trace. More moving features and a sweeter face. Yet above all, her length of hair, they own in golden ringlets the wave and graceful shone. So she was known for her absolutely sweet face. Now it's turned fearsome. And her beautiful hair now turn as snakes. Okay, so, of course, uh, you have the myth, right? Uh, Perseus, uh, of course, the hero set by 
Polydectus, the king of uh, Sihon, on the quest to bring him the head of Medusa. Of course, you know, immediately after the Gorgon was beheaded, the winged horse Pegasus sprung out from her neck, right? Oh, Pegasus coming from the neck, right? When the blood dripped from Medusa's head onto the plains of Libya, oh, notice this is Libya here again. Each drop of blood transformed into venomous serpents. The power of Medusa's head is seen again when Perseus encounters the Titan Atlas. So it's right. So and we're, we're seeing some interesting themes that are oftentimes not talked about, but here we go. Now, there are many objects dedicated to her. Um, and of course, you have the olive branch, uh, a serpent, an owl, a cock, a lance. The significance of Athena's owl, it's obviously symbolic, uh, is that um, it's interesting. Um, most of the images of an owl in ancient Greece simply represent Athena. Only rarely do we see Athena with the symbol of the owl. Uh, she never seems to appear with an owl. She, she, if she's made at all, she is the owl or she's herself, right? I know many days, you know, we, we see her holding the owl and everything else. Yeah, well, that's, that's it's not that the ancients don't see that. But it's either she is the representation of her is the owl or it's herself, one or the other. So it's a little interesting bit here. Um, and of course, the owl represents wisdom. The snake symbol, of course, has many connections to creation, fertility, regeneration. <clears throat> um, you know, this course uh, goes back again, we're back to an earlier source, this is the snaky aspect. Uh, of, of Athena, going back to the Mycenaeans and Minoans earlier. Uh, her garment is usually a Spartan tunic without sleeves. Uh, she is known for having an expression uh, of thoughtfulness and earnestness in many ways. Uh, in personality, Athena has an even temper. Uh, she is known to be very intelligent and very thoughtful, right? Very thoughtful. Uh, now, of course, uh, these attributes of Athena, when combined, made for a very powerful goddess in appearance. And Quintus Smyrenius uh, wrote, and he wrote in his <coughs> excuse me, Fall of Troy, written in the fourth century CE. It says as follows: Athena from Olympus swooped to forest-mantled Ida, quaked the earth and Xanthos murmuring streams. So mightily she shook them. From her immortal armor flashed around the hovering lightnings. Ooh, I like that, the hovering lightnings, right? Fearful serpents breathe fire from her shield, invincible. The crest of her great helmet swept the clouds more simply over. Uh, so, there, so anyway, you get the idea. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. I mean, she's just, you know, again, serpents and fire and whoa. Well, let's go into some of the origins now. If we have an idea who she is, let's go a little bit further. Okay. Um, now, a lot of sources do talk about uh, Athena being born from the head of Zeus. So let's go there. According to Hesiod, however, Metis was the first wife of Zeus, who was actually the mother of Athena. Who said so? Hesiod. Wait a second. I thought it came from Zeus's head. Who's this Metis? I mean, ruining all your stories. <laughs> so, so what happened is, is that Metis, uh, you know, was this, uh, this great goddess. We'll talk more about her in a few moments. And what happens is that when she was pregnant with, uh, with Athena, Zeus, on the advice of Gaia and Uranus, swallowed Metis up, swallowed his first wife up, and afterwards gave birth himself to Athena, who sprang from his head. What? Wait. <laughs> so, so wait, Zeus didn't 
he really didn't have Athena in that sense. He, he was part of it, but it still came from somewhere else. Yeah, the Titan goddess Metis um, resided over the fourth day of the week uh, in the planet Mercury. She was the goddess of wisdom and knowledge of the Titans. She was the goddess. Amongst the Titans, she's the goddess. The name Metis originally meant magical cunning. And so sometimes uh, she was viewed as wise and cunning, but kind of a trickster as well. You know, kind of the same powers that were possessed by Prometheus, right? And Zeus wanted this knowledge. He wanted this wisdom. And so what he did is he seduced Methus and then intentionally impregnated her and because uh, he wanted to expand his, this line with his own. But he also heard the prophecy saying that their child, Athena, would be so full of wisdom that it would exceed him. So Zeus swallowed Metis to gain her knowledge and make sure that this would not happen. And so, in fact, there are some stories where Metis is believed to still speak from Zeus's belly. <laughs> so what is going on here? Okay, so you can see this is something that is so obvious. This story appears, and it is, to represent the usurping of the goddess tradition, in this sense, the goddess Metis, who's possibly Minoan, by the patriarchy of the Mycenaeans. And so wisdom becomes cunning and treachery to the point where Zeus becomes justified by his actions. Yeah, this is, he literally swallows the goddess of wisdom and then gives birth to a goddess of wisdom, Athena, through his own head, but gaining the knowledge at the same time. For example, Hesiod calls Athena's mother the CV Metis. So now you can see also uh, Metis is now, she's a goddess of wisdom. Now it's time to demonize her, to bring her down. Uh, so again, this is the pushing down of the goddess, right? Uh, Hesiod calls her deceiving Metis, or thought. Although she was full and wise, he continues, but he seized her with his hands and put her in his belly for fear that she might bring forth something stronger than his thunderbolt. Therefore did Zeus, who sits on high and dwells in the ether, swallow her down suddenly. But she straightway conceived a palace Athena, and the father of men and gods gave birth to her by way of his head on the banks of the river Triton. I think this is interesting, because in this, in this version of the story, uh, she, he swallows her, but she gives birth already in herself, uh, from herself, in his belly, and then, of course, Athena escapes through his, through his head. It's interesting also, uh, this is said to be on the banks of the river Trito. So you're kind of combining things with the, with the word Trito, with not only coming from the head, but also alongside this river. And she remained hidden beneath the inward part of Zeus, even Metis, Athena's mother, worker of righteousness, who was wiser than gods and mortal men. There, the goddess was Athena received that, whereby she excelled in strength all the deathless ones who dwelled in Olympus, she who made the host scaring weapon of Athena, and with it, Zeus gave her birth arrayed in arms of war. Wow. Okay. So, here we go. <laughs> in the arm, adds that Hephaestus uh, split the head of Zeus with his axe, and that Athena sprang forth with a mighty war shout. Now, I, I, this is interesting. Pindar, who's also so early as a source, uh, has it not so glorious 
Uh, apparently, Athena is trying to rise out of the head and can't get out. <laughs> Talk about a headache. <laughs> so, according to Pindar, uh, they ask, uh, they ask uh, the, the forger god, the smith god, hey, you got an axe? Well, I'm going to have a splitting headache. <laughs> so, split my head with an axe so this goddess can get out. This is not a very beautiful description. <laughs> but uh, I will quickly move on. Uh, but then again, uh, I always like to stress the fact that nobody ever reads these sources. Okay. Anyway, and there was a war shout at the same time. Uh, Prometheus or Hermes uh, assisted, sometimes Pelamon, assisted Zeus in giving birth to Athena. And of course, the river Triton again is mentioned in these sources. Um, some sources relate that Athena sprung out from the head of Zeus, wearing full armor. Wow, you know, naturally the emanation, the ideas of wisdom uh, coming from the mind of God did influence various philosophical speculation in relating to how the universe began. So, uh, so you're going to see how this idea of, of how, like for example, Philo of Alexandria, you know, uh, he's known for his Middle Platonism in relation to Judaism. Uh, he makes his cosmology pretty, pretty uh, elaborate. And he talks about how these many emanations rising from the mind, from the head of God. Uh, Philo explains in one work how God first emanated the noetic cosmos, the intellectual universe, the place of mental abstractions. Uh, so, you know, and uh, you have this concept. Obviously, this is connected to um, Platonism. You know, this idea, we see this other places too. I know that if you study Hinduism, you know exactly who I'm going to bring up. Sarasvati, right? Yeah, Sarasvati. Uh, of the, you know, what happens here is that Brahman thinks, who is a great creator god, and out of his head is born Sarasvati, who is also a goddess of wisdom. Whoa. So wait. So you got Zeus and the goddess of wisdom coming out of his mind, that being Athena, and you have the god Brahman and the goddess Sarasvati coming out of his head, and that is known as Sarasvati. Yes. Uh, born of the thought, uh, as you say, in, in uh, Manasa Kanya, as they say, right? So there you have it. Is there a connection? It's possible. You know, again, these are, this is the Indo-European context. And so Indo-Europeans, remember, are spreading everywhere, including into India between 2000 to 1500 BCE uh, with the Aryans and the noble ones. All these traditions agree in making Athena a daughter of Zeus, but there is a second tradition. And I know you've been waiting for this. Actually, what's good, there's actually a third tradition. So let's talk, let's talk about one more and then we'll go a little bit further. What? So there's actually three traditions. Um, there's a second tradition where regards her as, hold your breath, as the daughter of Pallas. What? So Pallas Athena uh, is the, the daughter of Pallas, the winged giant, as opposed to the daughter of Triton, her best friend. So I know, Pallas, Pallas. You have two palaces here, uh, not to be confused with the a, a nice fine residence, right? Uh, you got the palace, which is, of course, you know, her her sister-like friend uh, who's the daughter of Triton, and she was adopted by Triton, and she accidentally kills her and then adopts a name palace. You have that one. But this is palace who's a winged giant. And in this case, this winged giant is the father of Athena. And that's why her name is Palace Athena, because it's connected to this particular um, God, right? And after, of course, uh, she's afterwards, of course, well, we'll keep going. The third tradition, because I can go on forever that one, and I don't want to get lost in that rabbit trail, because <laughs> I want to make sure we get to the Poseidon stuff today, right? The third tradition carries us to Libya and calls Athena a daughter of Poseidon. 
and of course, uh, Tritonus. Who's Tritonus? Tritonus, the, so this is her mom. Uh, in this case, Tritonus was the goddess nymph of the salt water, the goddess nymph of the salt water of a particular lake known as Lake Tritonus, located in Libya in North Africa. In this story, of the birth of a Libyan Athena, Triton, a Libyan sea god, sometimes identified with Poseidon and Tritonus, were the parents of two daughters uh, named uh, Athena and another name. Now to make things even more confusing, sometimes, hold your breath, sometimes that second daughter is also known as Pallas. Oh no, another one? <laughs> so wait, wait. Well, so, so in some cases, got it. If it's if, if she is, so here we have Zeus, you know, she doesn't like Zeus and she ends up uh, being raised by King Triton. Uh, King Triton sounds like oh, Mermaid. <laughs> raised by Triton. Uh, and of course, uh his daughter, uh, who of course is Alice, and they're like sister-like with their friends, even though she kills her. So you have that one. You have this other palace who is actually her father, and you have a third version where it's the daughter of and her sister. It's a daughter of Poseidon, and it's the sister, her sister, his palace. So wow, <laughs> a lot of palace going on here. Yes, I love this. This is so fun. Okay, at least for me. Are you having fun yet? All right. With this said, Athena. Uh, says Herodotus, on one occasion became angry with her father and with the Zeus. So in this case, now she gets angry with Poseidon, uh, and uh, who then, in this version of the story, makes her his own daughter. So now we have a different version of the story that she's from Poseidon, and she's going over to to, to Zeus, right? Herodotus writes. I'm just going to read to the source, right? Uh, it goes as follows. Next uh, to these, he's describing uh, Libya, by the way. Uh, next to these, Matheons are the Asians. These and the Matheons dwell around Lake Tritonis, and the river Triton is the boundary between them. And while the Matheons grow their hair long at the back of the head, the Asians do so in front. At the yearly festival of Athena, their maidens take their stand in two parties and fight against one another with stones and staves. And they say that in doing so, they are fulfilling the rites handed down by their fathers for the divinity who was sprung from that land, who we call Athena. And those of the maidens who die of the wounds, receive, they call, false maidens. What? Herodotus continues, but before they let them begin the fight, they do this. So there's, we're talking about this contest that's going on in Libya, this fighting contest, this festival dedicated uh, to, to Athena, where there are these, these maidens, and these maidens are fighting one another. Wow, right? So he continues, but before they let them fight, begin the fight, they do this. All join together and equip the maiden who is judged to be the fairest on the occasion with a Corinthian helmet and with full Hellenic armor, and then causing her to go up into a chariot, they conduct her around the lake. Now I cannot tell with what they equipped the maidens in old time before the Hellenes were settled near them, but I suppose that they used to be equipped with Egyptian armor, for it is from Egypt that both the shield and the hel helmet have come to the Hellenes, as I affirm. They say, moreover, that uh, Athena is a daughter of Poseidon and of uh, the lake Tritonis, and of course that's the wife, Tritonis, and that she had come cause of complaint against her father and therefore gave herself to Zeus, and Zeus made her his own daughter. Such is the story which they tell, and they have their intercourse with women in common, not marrying, but having intercourse like cattle. And when the child of any woman has grown big, 
he is brought before a meeting of the men held within three months of that time, and whosoever of the men the child resembles the son, he is accounted to be. <laughs> so it's like some, you know, Ron is probably making half of this up, right? <laughs> but but still, you have this legend going back, and there's other sources too. Now, this passage shows more clearly than any other the manner in which the genuine and ancient Hellenic myths were transplanted to Libya and where they're regarded as the sources for the Hellenic ones. Uh, and of course, we know that some of the some of those North Africa may have gone to Crete and then of course, took the idea of Athena with them. Athena then would be older than the time when the Sahara had dried up. The stories about Athena are actually older than the stories about Zeus. It's very possible whose head she was supposed to come out of. And we're going back to, yes, the Minoans. We'll go back a little bit earlier. Let's go a little bit earlier version of this because the word Poseidon, it turns out that across the entire Eastern Mediterranean, before Zeus was a big deal, Poseidon was the big deal. Yes, Poseidon. Now, of course, we take a look at this. I know we see Poseidon as the god of the sea, you know, but uh, in reality, uh, he is was more than that earlier times. Uh, we know, of course, he was known as the Earth Shaker. Uh, we find his name, uh, Earth Shaker, uh, even in Linear B Mycenaean text, the Emicida One, right? Uh, so Poseidon, the word Poseidon uh, literally means, of course, Posis, which was from Potus, uh, which means can be translated as spouse, right? And of course, Poseidon, Ida, Da, which of course, Da comes from Ga and Ge. Uh, it's the same root as Gaia, right? And that means earth. So Poseidon simply means the spouse of the earth or the earth goddess, right? And of course, the earth goddess, that would be Da Mater, right? So you have, once again, the same Poseidon, Poseida, Ida, Da, Da, right? You got the Da, I see word earth, Da Mater, earth, Da, Mater, mother. So Poseidon uh, is the spouse of the earth, and Da Mater uh, is, of course, the earth mother. <laughs> uh, and this, of course, goes all the way back, right? And so what's going to happen is what's holy to them uh, is, of course, on Crete, as well as overlooking Troy, you got a mountain known as Ida. Ida, of course, is simply Mount Earth, <laughs> the root of the earth. It makes a lot of sense, right? Okay, so there you have it. So these are early connections. There's a sign very important earlier on. And so what will happen is that he is the God, he has a tri triune aspect, sky, earth, and the underworld. Eventually, after a few things, uh, he gets demoted uh, to the sea. And then Hades takes his, the area, fills in the vacuum of the underworld. And of course, Zeus takes over the realm of the, of the sky. That comes later. Respecting this Libyan Athena, it is further related that she was educated by the river god Triton. Here we get the Triton aspect. Together, in some versions of the story, with his own daughter, Pallas. But in some cases, of course, Pallas uh, is the sister that he has, that she has with Poseidon. Uh, she was said to have invented the flute. That's what I'm trying to get at. Uh, uh, and, uh, as a daughter of Poseidon, Athena was then depicted as having blue rather than gray eyes. Yes. So here he goes. I'm going to give you my source right now. Pausanias in the second century CE, he's kind of a, he writes a travel on, in his description of Greece, uh, notes as follows. He says, I saw that the statue of Athena had blue eyes. For the Libyans have a saying that the goddess is the daughter of Poseidon, and for this reason has blue eyes like 
Poseidon, unquote. <laughs> so, uh, so what happens is, is that you had two versions of Athena going around, and Pausanias and others could say, well, uh, you got the blue-eyed version. The blue-eyed version comes from the, uh, the Poseidon, and the gray-eyed, gray-eyed version is the Zeus, which kind of connects to the sky element, right? But you do have gray oceans, I know that, but uh, there you have it. And so uh, it gets interesting because I think in many ways, well, I know, I should say, that the earliest versions is the Poseidon version. So if you want to dig and find more out about Athena, you look for the blue-eyed as opposed to the gray-eyed goddess. Now, of course, obviously, uh, the connection with Athena, with Triton, the river god, the educated goddess, as well as Tritonus, caused afterwards the various traditions about her birthplace. We talked about those. So you have all these variations, you know, but Libya seems to be a very popular version, uh, uh, sorry, uh, aspect where they think that she's from, uh, many different levels. Okay. Um, okay, I'm skipping stuff because I've seen our time is starting to roll pretty fast. Uh, it is entirely possible that the place named, name of Athens, preceded the arrival of the Indo-Europeans. So which I think is interesting because there's a connection now between Athens and Athena. So uh, but what does this word come from? When we take a look, right, and we see the word, the Indo-European root, and a possible translation is that the a, ah, it means to, to give to a lot, or to run and to flow. And this refers to possibly the spring, maybe the salt spring that is a, that's on top uh, of, the, um, uh, of, of the Acropolis that's located there. So that's a possibility on that. But of course, we take a look a little bit further because I actually have identified an earlier form of the word Athena and, um, and other scholars have as well. It's pretty obvious, but uh, we'll go back a little ways. Let's go back to the Minoan and into the Mycenaean period, looking at linear A, but linear B texts. And we find here a word, remember it's Athena, and the word is Atana, Atana Poitinia. Say Atana, that's Athena. So as early as the Mycenaeans, going back to the Minoans, you have Atena, which is Athena, and you have the Potenea. Potenea means mistress. So it is Mistress Athena. Wow. Now, let's go a little further. This, uh, of course, you have uh, also Atena the Wea. And not to know, Athena. And uh, we also find that this word is also associated with the sun. So, Athena, which means Athena, can also mean Athena, which is connected to Luvian. So, these are the, the, the brothers of the Hittites who lived along the coastline. And this means sun. And that means Athena is connected to the concept of the sun, which is pretty interesting, right? So she is, earlier on, she could be a sun goddess. Now we take a look and we find uh, the Minoans and Mycenaeans, many sun-like designs appear on, on seals and several instances. Uh, the Cretan materials, the sun, appears to be playing a part in various cult rituals, various scenes that are linked with women. Uh, and so, and we see it, there's, a, there's, we see a link with these seals and these images with what we see in Egypt and those sun images. To go a little bit further, we see these kinds of images all over the Aegean, so connect to the sun and that which is most holy. Uh, in the Cyclades, we find these frying pan objects that are represent representing the sun. But as we take a look at it, we realize that they're connected to, uh, well, there's a female uh, pubic triangle that's right on there, right? 
<laughs> so, okay, let's go a little bit further. Let's go, let's go a little bit more deeper down the rabbit hole since we're down here. <laughs> and uh, here we go. Uh, so, uh, also, uh, Atana, which is Athena, connected to Asasarame, right? Which is, of course, connected to the sun goddess of Arana, uh, of the Hittites, who is a goddess of the earth. So there's another connection that goes even, even earlier. But, um, but we find evidence that Atana later on, oh, can I do this for you? I'll do it. Atana becomes a version of core in the, in the linear in the linear B texts, which is Persephone. <laughs> I wish I had more time to unpack this, but I don't. So when we take a look at this, we realize that from inscriptions, I'll go through one just for fun, just so you hear it. We realize that early on that you're going to have Poseidon, who is with Demeter, so, right, spouse of the earth, who is with the earth mother, and their daughter is Atana, who is Persephone. <laughs> so there's a connection between Athena and core Persephone. And by the way, these traditions do survive, like places like Arcadia even into uh, the first, second century CE. So this is not me just putting these things together. <laughs> They're there. <laughs> Poseidon uh, and, and Demeter, they are a couple, according to the Arcadians, as well as other, who says so, Pausani, so many other sources. You are just going, this is too much. It sure is. And I'm going to give you a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Edge it up a little bit. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just take, give you a, a read in the scripture. Why not? Athena uh, here is, uh, this is an inscription from Cofinus uh, in Southern Crete. And I'm just going to go ahead and read it. Uh, so Athena, here's Athena, which is Athena. Uh, the we, you know, we already know what that means, right? Uh, Terusa. Okay, so Terusa is distressed. It's 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 kind of hard to go through this, but uh, it could be. It's from the Truo, um, and then it goes. So Athena distressed, and then it goes uh, uh, Durore, uh, which of course Durore is like a third singular past medial passive Duramai, right? So basically uh, distressed, lamented, right? Uh, and it goes on. It says um, and uh, Dura, Ida. Una canesi uh, epinema mesorute. Uh, so what we have here is Athena distressed, lamented. And Ida appeared in her dream, one of strong name tore her hair. <laughs> That's the best I can do. <laughs> most, most people can do when they're going through this without a lot of context. But you see here, you have this Athena, who is distressed, and she's lamenting, and there appears Ida, which means Ida, of course, Da, which is the earth, which is connected to the demeanor. And so you have here a connection to, between Atano or Atana, which is Athena, directly in the inscription with Demeter, <laughs> and her being in the sense of distress. Oh, wow. Well, uh, we could go even further. There's, there's other inscriptions as well. Um, um, uh, from a libation table that gives you some more information too, and a magic cup uh, who talks about unperceived, you lament about gifts, the lady established something or so forth. Uh, but there you have it. And it's interesting because this Minoan, Mycenaean, Athena, uh, her connection uh, is uh, uh, is her double X, this, which, which, by the way, the sign of the double X is sometimes used to designate the letter A as in the first letter of her name. So this double X connection is there. We see descriptions of her with some festival 
known as the Skira on the inscriptions. And she is, in some cases, understood as a sun goddess again, uh, and uh, a lady, you know, truly that moves in dreams. Of course, I have like three or four or five or six pages of just that. <laughs> okay, we went pretty deep there. I mean, really deep. Uh, let's let's pull away a little bit because uh, I need to wrap this this up. But I hope you're enjoying it so far. Okay, so from various traditions, Athena arose, and in most other cases, these beliefs began uh, with various legends that kind of can, kind of come together amongst the uh, the Greeks. But there's also connections uh, to Asia Minor. Of the Aegean, and of course, most especially even Libya. So North Africa, Athena is connected to the creation of the olive tree. This is the one story I want to make sure we get to because it's going to have a lot of significance. And here we go. So the story goes is once upon a time, who is going to have, who is going to be the patron goddess of Athens? This is my closing story. Who's going to be the patron goddess of, of Athens? And there's a contest that happens between Athena and Poseidon. Here we go again. It's more, uh, you know, um, well, okay, so what happens is, is that Poseidon uh, wants to show that, uh, you know, he's going to give the, Athenian, the, the Athenians a special gift. So uh, he hits his trident in the rock which is also interpreted as uh, a living, well, never mind. So he hits a trident on the rock and out comes a spring. So we're on top of the Acropolis, here comes a spring, but the spring is of salty water. She quietly plants something and this becomes the olive tree. And so who's going to win this contest? Well, of course, it's going to be Athena. Who wants a saltwater spring on top of a hill when you can have the olive, which is not only for you know, cultivation of olives, but for olive oil, uh, which is used for, for obviously the light, uh, as well as rubbings, <laughs> massages, you know, oil yourself down, and stidrus, you know, kind of wipe it all off there. Uh, you know, the funny thing is, is that uh, there's a story that survived from, of all people, Augustine. And I don't know why in the world it survived, but it did. <laughs> and why Augustine is quoting it, I have no idea why. But St. Augustine later on says, yeah, there was a contest, and they mentioned that uh, it was a vote. And a vote was between men and women. I mean, the men and women both voted at that time. So both men and women had the right to vote. At Athens, and it was because of the women's vote that Poseidon lost the contest because the women voted the majority for the olive tree. And so that's how that occurred. But Augustine says, because of that, uh, and because after that, uh, Poseidon flooded Athens and attacked the city and caused so much mischief, because of that, he says, women lost the, vote, the right to vote in Athens. So he said that ultimately uh, Athena lost because the women lost the vote. That's a very strange thing, especially for St. Augustine to say, but he is drawing on earlier sources. And I wish those earlier sources had survived because I would like to know more about women and men voting together in Athens. That would be really interesting, right? At least, at least to go into that. So, so she won. And she becomes the patron goddess of, of Athens. She also becomes a goddess of all wisdom, knowledge, and art. Uh, she becomes a patron divinity of the state. In fact, uh, she instituted the ancient court at the Areopagus. And it's interesting because if there is a tie in the vote of this governmental body, if there's a tie in this vote, it automatically is believed that Athena is going to cast the vote on the side of the defendant. So it's equal. 
then it'll be on the defendant aspect. And this is one thing I want to really drill at home here. Yes, of course, uh, Athena continued to be connected to war just like Ares, but there's a difference. She does not bear the arms. Specifically, she borrows them from Zeus only in, during a time of need. See, while Mars always has it, she borrows it from Zeus because she does not feel that she has to always hold the weapons, only during times of need. And he, she does not aspire to the savage love of war. war. <clears throat> in, fact, um, in fact, she does not love war for its own sake, but simply on account of the advantages which the state gains in the engagement of it, no less, no more, even though the two are shown as fighting together, she very strongly believes it's a means to an end. And only, and the idea is, the focus is there's a need for peace. The reason for war is to have peace as opposed to what Aries says. I think that's amazing, really is. And when we take a look at her, she also holds this liminal space between masculine and feminine. Sometimes she's dressed as a male. Sometimes she's dressed as a female. Sometimes she's androgynous a lot of the times. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, Philostratus, uh, the younger, wrote as follows. He says, three goddesses standing near them. They need no interpretations to tell who they are. For Athena is recognized at a glance, clothed as she in what the poets call the penelope of her race, casting a bright glance from under her helmet and ruddy of face, as well as masculine in general appearance, unquote. In fact, the androgyny of uh, Athena is so characteristic of this goddess that we can hardly even speak of Pallas Athena if only one or the other side stood before us without the tension to the polarity of both. There is a sense of equality uh, between them. Even though she is a female, she takes on uh, what is understood as a traditional masculine role, but she transcends it, but she still is feminine. And she is worshipped, as I said, from all over Greece, but all over the Greco-Roman world. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you have this magnificent temple dedicated to her upon the Acropolis. You have the Parthenon, where her beautiful image was there for the world to see for centuries, and it was such a marvel. Athena really brings out the best of us when it comes to her characteristics. She's all about balance, wisdom with knowledge, right? Kindness, but also intuition. She is this beautiful balance that we need more than ever to keep and to hold that which is the divine measure. Thank you so much. All right. Phew, we covered a lot, I think. We did. All right. We got to page 28, so I'm pretty proud of myself there. Although I skipped five pages of, of, of linear B inscriptions, so... <laughs> But I thought, you know, as, a, as opposed to just you know, saying things, I like to give the, the, the primary sources. Backing. And you get to, to, to hear my Sinead in Greek. Isn't that great? <laughs> yes, that was very interesting. Oh, all right. All right, so somebody says, da, 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 da. would like to see the material on linear B, you know, oh, yeah, somebody asked a question. I would love to, yeah, I, I can't do this, so I don't know how to show you the linear B information. I do know that I actually taught a 
a, a single little class uh, at ipso facto on linear, linear B. And I wish I could do that online. That would be fun, in which I do go over these, these encryptions. That makes any sense. So let me go through it slowly, how to, how to read it. So just thought that'd be, that would be a good online course, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Linear B made easy, right? So but thank you for the question. Yes, any other questions? I love it, David. Thank you for asking the question. Does does Augustine mention his sources for the the, uh, no, the notion that women that, that drives me crazy? That's the that's the problem. It's, it's first of all, why in the world is he quoting this? You know, and I, reading the context, he's saying this because he's trying to prove that Poseidon is a demon. You know, that's that seems to be his background. You know, how bad Poseidon is. Although he leaves Athena out of the the equation there. And so look what he did to women. And I thought it's kind of interesting. It's like, well, you're so patriarchal yourself when it comes to women. What in the world are you doing? Uh, you know, you know, you know, cast the uh, cast the uh, the log out of your own eye. <laughs> you, know? you know, but he's like, ah, I can't believe they have the right to vote. Well, you don't have there's no right to vote in your society either. So what are you griping about? You know, let me gain the vote so late. I, I think it's a very strange passage in every way. <laughs> Like he hit his head, <laughs> but he must have got it from somewhere. I mean, he, from his uh, traditional Judeo-Christian context of his time in the role of women as perceived by Augustine, as we know in the Latin West, this uh, this idea of him even talking about the fact that there is women as well as men voted uh, a long time ago in Athens tells you that his source is it's not him. Obviously, he's not. He wouldn't want to come up with something like this. The problem is. Where is the source? And that's what I brought up. I said, I wish there were, we knew. That would be great. I hear some other, buddy talking, I think, or something. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, Carl. Good question. Is there a connection between Athena and the Greek philosophical tradition? Yes, there is. Uh, and, and in fact, that was the section I skipped. <laughs> 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 so, so yes, uh, Athena connects to Sophia, which connects to, uh, which, which goes into uh, not only uh, Platonism, not only the Middle Platonism, but goes into Neoplatonism. And so you have an aspect in many, uh, many of the uh, writers, as well as, I'll just mention, you guys ever heard of Julian the Apostate or Julian the Great? Uh, Julian will actually bring up Athena. Uh, within this context of connecting to the which are the emanations from the monad or the one. So you have this idea of Athena or Sophia being that which is wisdom that comes forth. So yes. Thank you. Great question, Marco. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I was had to run through all these questions, but uh, I mean the lecture was so uh, long. But uh, I would love to do a talk. I'm not sure who mentioned it. I would love to do a talk just on I would like to do a talk on middle Platonism. That would be, there's not enough on that, but I also like to do a talk on neo Platonism, just throwing those out. So, and I can be pretty intense about it, but um, uh, I think it would be fun. I'll, I'll try to make it fun. <laughs> uh, I, but I think middle Platonism, like nobody knows about middle Platonism except for scholars who are talking amongst themselves. And we just skip from Platonism to neo Platonism. We forget. It's in between, but I do want to say this. This is this is the perk for Middle Platonism. The background of early Christianity, Middle Platonism. So, if you want to understand so much of of not only New Testament studies but the early Church Fathers, Middle Platonism. Philo of Alexandria, the great Jewish thinker of Alexandria, a Middle Platonist. You know, you have Justin Martyr, Middle Platonist. Clement Alexandria, Middle Platonist, Origin of Alexandria, Middle Platonist, <laughs> Numinius, Middle Platonist, right? All these. So the concepts that we understand as the Trinity uh, is based upon Middle Platonic thought first and well formed. And in the Trinity in the in a in a non-Christian context, understood uh, in the triune emanation conception, and then it's brought over to fruition 
when it comes to Neoplatonism. So a lot of people say, yeah, it's all Neoplatonism. And I go, ah, 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 ah. It's middle Platonism, <laughs> but Neoplatonists adopted that. That would be a lot of fun because it would really unpack uh, so much of even understanding uh, early church fathers of both the East and the West. But anyway, that's a sidestep. I love philosophy. <laughs> I just want people to show up. That's <laughs> really philosophical. It's like, oh, we got three. <laughs> <laughs> Three people, you know, that's the inherent weakness, you know. So, if, if I can guarantee enough people that would show up for a talk of Neoplatonism or Middle Platonism, I'd be overjoyed to talk about it. So, um, yeah, guarantee more than three. <laughs> <laughs> We've been down this road before. <laughs> yeah. I'm all for it. So, any other questions? Oh, thank you, Carly. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, great. Okay. Um, did we cover everything? I, you know, I, I think it was fun uh, seeing how Athena is not exactly what we think, you know, when it comes to Poseidon. It's like, oh, you know, we have to see, is it the blue-eyed or is the gray-eyed goddess? You know, now, now we have the problem now with uh, uh, Athena, the idea of, of Athena connected with Persephone. And it makes sense now with the other family that would be Poseidon, Demeter, right? And Athena, as it was before with Poseidon, Tritonus, and Athena, right? So you still have it. And that idea flowed over uh, to North, uh, North Africa, Libya, which makes me also, there seems to be a Mycenae connection. But there's also, I see in many writings, a Minoan connection, a Minos connection. So I think when the Minoan civilization spread throughout uh, the eastern into the western Mediterranean, uh, you have this cohesive culture that was created, which includes the area of North Africa. And I think there's more work to be done when it comes to the Libyan context. All right. All right. Well, I guess we're closing up. Okay. Thank you so much for coming.